this week we've all been astonished by the scenes of devastation from the earthquake and the tsunami in Japan. Some of you may have met or noticed that we had a young monk here for a month named Shinko, Shinko-san. He's training at Sojiji Monastery, one of the two um, main monasteries in Soto Zen in Japan. And so he came on a kind of exchange for a month. He left to return home on Wednesday afternoon, and he probably arrived home just about the time that the earthquake happened. His home temple is in Fukushima, which is the worst hit area. Also, Ajo McMullen, who is our fellow Zen priest at the Eugene Zendo uh, down in, uh, in southern Oregon, or middle Oregon. Also, his home temple is in Sendai, which is the hardest hit area. Now, I'm not sure, but I think his in-laws may live in that area too. We don't know what's happened uh, because communications are cut off. And uh, you see all kinds of uh, distressing messages on the web, one from a mother who's in America whose son is an exchange student in a high school in Sendai, and she hasn't heard from him, and she's tried calling the home phone number of his teacher, but there's no answer. So how long will she have to wait to find out, is her son alive or dead? And not just, of course, that mother, but so many other mothers and parents and children and friends and employees, and it may take months to sort out who's died, just who's died. We're all touched by this disaster, even if we don't know people associated with it directly. We all have hearts that ache when we see these scenes that look like they're incredibly detailed special effects in some horror movie. We see a tiny car on a little road, and we see this huge wave that roils across the landscape, carrying this enormous jumble of hundreds of houses, trucks, and boats, and greenhouses, and cars, and bodies, and piles of debris, and trains. And we see the tiny car trying to escape, and then finally engulfed. And we wonder, what was the mind state of the person in that car as that happened? And of course, what we're really wondering is what would my mind state be if on a sunny, ordinary day, suddenly death loomed over me? We hear stories about the possibility of a nuclear meltdown, not just in one, but two nuclear power plants in the country that has the safest standards in the whole world. And our old fears of nuclear winter suddenly arise from the dusty drawers of our memory, those of us who are old enough to have that, that memory of that real fear. Just this winter, obvious evidence of climate change. The Earth's magnetic pole is shifting dramatically now, suddenly, up to 25 miles a year. And just this one earthquake shifted at eight centimeters and completely altered the coastline of Japan. We're in, a, we're in a period now, of, since 1994, we've come out of a period of quiescence in terms of earthquakes, and we've now entered a time of activity of earthquakes, earthquakes in China, Haiti, New Zealand, and now Japan. And we're told that the Pacific Northwest could easily be next. We're on the ring where this could happen next, and also there's evidence that, of huge earthquakes and huge tsunamis in the historical past here in Oregon and Washington. So what is our refuge in this time of apparent sudden change? We have to look carefully. What is our refuge? What's wonderful about things like this is that the veil of delusion that we will be able to live a happy life without any unexpected or major changes coming along is lifted. And suddenly we're awake. This is part of being awake. Instead of half asleep in a wealthy country where we have as much as we want to eat and wear and houses that seem secure and jobs that were secure and are now getting a little shaky. 
we've been lulled half asleep. Something like this wakes us up. Hopefully not just briefly. We don't want it to wake us up into anxiety, but we want, to wake, we want it to wake us up into pondering. What, what is going on? What is this all about? And what can I take refuge in when everything could suddenly be turned upside down? as we have seen on our screens. When I was a child, we sang a song that I was thinking of this morning. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is shifting sand, all other ground is shifting sand. So people often ask Buddhists, how can you be happy? What can you turn to if you don't have Christ to turn to or God to turn to? This is a very good question. That's a very good question. When I was uh, working at the hospital in the neonatal intensive care unit, we often had very, very sick babies that would die. Um, It was very, very sad for the families and for for us taking care of the babies. But often people console themselves by saying, well, this is part of God's plan. We don't understand God's plan, but this is part of God's plan. And that was a great consolation, and I thought at the time, and was sometimes asked, well, so if you don't have that consolation, what do you do? Doesn't that leave you feeling empty and sad? On the other hand, you can say, well, you can, you can interpret God's plan. Well, God is angry at human beings because they're so sinful, so God is sending down these disasters, you know, like the plagues. I don't know. Maybe God's angry because we're not taking care of the earth. I don't know. You know there's lots of ways to try to imagine what God is thinking um, and uh, you know, frame it in whatever you're thinking, however you're thinking. Personally, I think God's mind is too enormous for us to imagine. So what do we rely on? This is a very good question. It's something we have to ponder carefully. What do Buddhists rely on? What do they lean back into in times of upheaval, in times of great sorrow? Well, there are several things that we rely on. They seem very simple, but they're actually very solid rocks. We rely upon the precepts. We rely upon virtue. Virtue is a very old-fashioned word. People don't like to use it now because it's become become flavored with uh, Judeo-Christian interpretation in this culture of sin and blame and to be virtuous is to be sanctimonious. But virtue has a, a beauty to it. Hogan gave a very lovely talk on Thursday night at the Dharma Center on virtue. Living a life of virtue, deciding I will live by the precepts. There's a huge relief in your life when you just decide I will live by the precepts. Just like there's a relief in your life when you decide I won't drink anymore. And the other, the other side, the flip side of I won't drink anymore, is living the life of the precepts. So when difficulties arise, when we're tremendously stressed as human beings, we rely on our promise not to kill, not to steal, not to lie, even in the middle of a disaster. We rely, we rely upon our promise to share what we have, not to be greedy, to share what we have both material aid and spiritual aid with those in need. So maybe we send money to relief funds. We come together here, we practice here together, leaning on each other, find consolation in talking to each other. And we rely upon our promise not to fall back on other refuges, refuges that, that just add to the pot of the world's suffering. This is my little algebra of suffering which I, maybe it's one teaching I'll be remembered for after I die. (laughs) If there's N amount of suffering in the world, and right now that N is big, 
very big. There's an amount of suffering in the world, and we cause more suffering or suffer ourselves. We've made it n plus one. Well, that's not our goal, to add to suffering in the world. Our goal is to relieve suffering in the world. And if we rely on false refuges, on refuges that just add more distress to the world, if we rely on anger, if we rely on alcohol, if we rely on drugs, if we, if we rely on unhealthy sexual activity, then we've created more suffering. It's so tempting, though, to use those to console ourselves. It's so tempting when things are unstable to take our distress, which is very uncomfortable to hold in our own heart and mind, to feel that distress. You know, some people do that. I just don't want to look at the pictures. I don't want to, I, I've heard about it, but I don't want to see the pictures. It's too upsetting. We, we need to see it. We need to take it in through our eyes and then hold it in our hearts and our minds. However uncomfortable that is, we need to hold it. And not project it outwards. Not find someone to blame or someone to grab onto. Not find someone to attack. Attacking someone else instead of doing the difficult spiritual work of holding our sorrow in our hearts and feeling it and then using it to do deep pondering, to fuel our deep pondering that is the essence of our practice. In order to deepen our understanding of how things really are. And to deepen our compassion. One of the blessings of a natural disaster is there's nobody to blame. And usually our, we want to find somebody to blame, but in a natural disaster we keep reaching out and there's nobody to blame. The earth gives a huge shrug. You know, just like us sitting here in Zazen, if some tension builds up in our shoulder and we shrug our shoulder, well, the earth <coughs> builds up tension too. <coughs> Periodically it just shakes it off. And this is the result. Huge, amount of water, huge amounts of water are displaced and it goes where it can. It flows where it's able. There's no one to blame. So, one of the beauties of natural disasters is we don't waste time blaming. We just move as one body to do what needs to be done. The other blessing of this kind of disaster is compassion is aroused. We can't help but feeling compassion when we see these pictures. Absorbing world sounds awakens the Buddha right here. Absorbing world sounds awakens the Buddha right here. The groaning of the buildings as they are crushed. The smashing of the cars, the sound of that rushing water. And knowing that there are people crying out under the rubble today, right now, hoping that someone will be able to rescue them. The people who've lost, maybe lost, don't know if they've lost loved ones. Absorbing world sounds awakens the Buddha right here. Our own petty worries disappear when we see suffering on this scale. What was I worried about? Last week we got our, we had two cracked windshields in two of the monastery cars and we got them replaced. Well, that was good. But cracked windshields kind of go down on your list when there's an earthquake and a tsunami. So suddenly our mind is cleared of all the little petty things that we've been so absorbed in when we see something like this. And compassion is aroused. True compassion is aroused. Avalokiteshvara is she who hears the cries of the world and responds. So imagine if you were Avalokiteshvara and you could hear all the cries of suffering people in the entire world right now. Reminds me of that, remember the, the movie, I think it was called Almighty Bruce, where Bruce suddenly becomes God, takes over God, goes on a vacation, and Bruce takes over, and suddenly the line is jammed with everybody with all their requests. And he, uh, at first he thinks this is fun, and for about 10 minutes. Imagine all the people's prayers coming in to you. But even worse, imagine all of the cries of suffering that you can hear and feel. 
thousands, tens of thousands of people in Japan alone. If we could hear all of their cries, their distress cries, feel all of their sorrow. That's what Avalokiteshvara does, absorbs all of those cries and is not indifferent. She weeps. She was moved by the suffering and she weeps. But her tears are collected in a vase. So often you see Avalokiteshvara holding a vase. As she weeps, her tears are collected in a vase. And through the power of her practice, those tears are transformed into amrita, a nectar, a nectar of immortality, the nectar of understanding what our life is really about, the eternal base of all of this, the deathless, the unconditioned, the absolute foundation of our lives. So she pours out that nectar as spiritual aid to people so that they too can touch that foundation, stand on that foundation. <coughs> Return to that foundation when things get unstable, when the earth shakes, whether it's this earth or the earth of our lives, shakes. And then we too become able to hear more cries in the world and respond more appropriately. Our chant also says this Buddha receives only compassion. Now that's something to ponder. Can we see this earthquake? as compassion, can we receive it as compassion? That everything that comes towards us is not a disaster, but is somehow compassionate teaching to help us become more wise and more kind. <clears throat> 